Welcome everyone to today's webinar, the design of fire tube boiler rooms. Today we're going to be going over how to design a successful boiler room and I'm joined here by Rob Bond and Grant Bowman. They have a combined over 30 years <clears throat> of designing boiler room um, understanding and they know the inter ins and outs of how to design a proper fire tube boiler room. A few things before we start, we are going to have a live question and answer session at the end of this. So if you have questions, we're going to be having a short period where we're going to take those questions live. There's a chat box on your left or sometimes it's at the bottom of your screen. You can just put your questions in there and we can answer them at the end. So you can put your questions during the webinar. You can also email Grant Bowman and Robert Bond and they will be able to uh, get back to you with those answers before or um, during or after the webinar. So if you have a question later, feel free to contact Robert um, Bond and Grant Bowman and ask them a question. Robert Bond and Grant Bowman are, um, they work at ACS. It's, it's one of our rep firms here close to, uh, or in Connecticut, close to New York City. So they have a lot of experience designing fire tube boiler rooms. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, we have, our preferred puts out this boilers demystified series. It's just a bunch of information that helps you understand fire tube boilers and other types of boilers. It gives you a little sizing chart. It's, it's a, little, a lot of helpful information if you're working on boiler room design. We'd love to send this to you. If you, uh, if you want to, you can either email Grant or Rob. Um, they can forward me um, your address and I can send this out to you. It's 11 and a half by, or it's 11 by 17 sheet of paper. We laminated it on both sides and it's just a good reference to put in your office or put at your um, home desk if you're looking for information about fire tube or about boilers in general and boiler rooms. Um, like I said, you can email me, Grant or Rob, and we'll send this out to you. The last thing is we have other webinars that are going to be going on um, in two weeks and then in a month later, we have um, our next webinar, which is in two weeks, cold weather fuel system design right now. And um, obviously in the, in the South, they're having intense cold, which is not, um, always um, good for fuel system design if you're not designing for that type of uh, weather. So we're going to go over how to design a, a cold weather fuel system. And David Oaf and Alex Kenny of Preferred Utilities is going to put that webinar on. Also, we have a renewable fuels uh, web webinar coming up in a month on March 18th. <clears throat> that webinar is going to go over how to convert your boiler room to be more renewable and sustainable uh, for future. All right, we're gonna go ahead and start the webinar. Like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to send them to Grant, Rob, or myself, and we will try to answer those at the end. The other way you can do it is you can put questions in the chat. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Robert Bond. And this is Grant Bowman. And we're with uh, Analytical and Combustion Systems. And today we're going to be talking to you guys about fire tube boiler system design. Uh, we're a representative firm based here in Bethel, Connecticut. Uh, we represent uh, in Connecticut, upper, upstate New York, New York City, uh, northern Jersey, and a few other areas. Um, we can help you guys with anything uh, boiler, fuel oil uh, related. All right, this slide shows you sort of an agenda that we're gonna be going about today um, for uh, fire tube boiler system design. Uh, we're gonna talk about some design considerations uh, regarding your plant and uh, the location and application uh, that it's gonna be feeding. Uh, the manufacturing of a fire tube boiler, uh, standard boiler trim for hot water and steam boilers, uh, burners and controls uh, equipment that uh, amplify your boiler use. Um, auxiliary equipment uh, like blow down, de aeration, um, and then going further into that, we're going to talk about uh, boiler feed water systems. On this slide, we're going to talk about some design considerations uh, for your plant. Uh, so, there's two main types of steam plants you've you got your uh, high steam pressure plant and a low steam pressure plant. Anything sub 15 psi uh, 
for your steam is considered a section 4 heating boiler and that would be a low pressure plant um, and anything above 15 psi would be considered a high pressure plant where you get into section 1 power boilers um, and for your high temp hot water plants uh, if you're designing one of those anything below 160 psig and or not exceeding 250 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for your water is considered a section 4 uh, heating boiler um, and then anything above 160 psi uh, and or exceeding 250 degrees Fahrenheit is a section 1 uh, power boiler um, another thing to consider is uh, is this a sort of a district utility uh, steam plant that you're designing or is this a just sort of a local heating plant for a couple uh, for one building in particular or maybe two or three buildings um, is it a steam or is it a hot water plant and things to consider so for a steam uh, let's say you're doing a, a steam plant that's sort of central for a couple um, buildings five or six buildings things you're gonna want to pay attention to are the steam traps uh, located around the system uh, to collect all your condensate uh, your condensate return and how you're getting that back to your uh, condensate receiver and then back to your uh, feed water tank for your boiler um, system pressure that you're gonna need in your header to distribute the steam and then zone your zone control valves and how you're going to incorporate that into um, sort of a balanced uh, zone and a balanced plant throughout. Um, for hot water, um, another th things to pay attention to are your delta T, um, hot water going out, hot water returning in your system, uh, and the efficiency related there, uh, your hot water system pumps, uh, your big centrifugal uh, distribution pumps for your system. Uh, this, again, the system pressure uh, for the hot water and then your zone control valves for each uh, building or uh, zone that you might have. Efficiency, sustainability, and emissions. Uh, this is where you can get into the nitty gritty of uh, developing one system sort of that's better than another dependent on manufacturers of the boilers, burners, controls, uh, what kind of fuel you're using. Um, natural gas, number two fuel oil, or maybe a biofuel, or some kind of renewable um, energy uh, that you could get RINs or RIN credits for um, with the government. Um, so we're going to get into that a little later on, but uh, that is sort of the, it's a key element that's normally overlooked uh, when it comes to uh, system design, but this is where you can pick up uh, efficiency points. Um, dependent upon uh, how strict you want to be on the burners uh, and controls and the turn down that you might get with your system. Um, and then just sort of touching back on the size of uh, your system and the application. Is this a steam or hot water system that's uh, for an industrial uh, municipal size? Um, or are you, uh, you know, a hospital steam plant with high pressure steam, or is it a light commercial, you know, for uh, residential buildings and, um, or just uh, for commercial usage? Um, that's all very important to keep uh, in your mind with uh, sort of the quality that you're designing with um, and the, you know, the price tag that you might end up putting on the job. Why fire two boilers? Let's first start with size. Uh, rigging into place most of the time isn't an issue. However, uh, if it's a tight job site, you will be able to field direct if necessary. Uh, fire tubes are generally smaller than water tube boilers. However, they can be uh, long and they require some tube pull, so that will affect your uh, layout. Quality, fire tube boilers have a proven design since the 1800s. Robust construction, everything is made of steel, not a lot of refractory. If properly taken care of, they can last for decades. Efficiency. With natural gas firing, a fire tube boiler can run in the low 80s. Uh, with uh, fuel oil, they can uh, run in the high 80s in efficiency. Maintenance, 
Uh, fire tube boilers are relatively low maintenance if properly tuned and the feed water is properly treated. Tube replacements are relatively simple if the water treatment is not done properly and the tubes begin to corrode. On the cost side of things, a fire tube boiler is going to be much more economical than a water tube boiler. Well, I mean, I think the key is that with the, the fire tube boilers is if you need to replace tubes, it's easy. Right. All right, we're going to talk about the uh, two main types of designs of fire tube boilers. You got the wet back uh, versus the dry back design. Uh, there's a wa so the water back has a full water back construction, and this helps eliminate the thermal stresses. You can see on the picture in the bottom left. Um, there's two tube sheets that reduce the thermal stress. Uh, there's no refractory on the back end doors. Uh, this refractory tends to crack and stress uh, with the thermal expansion of the boiler um, as you go from low fire to high fire um, and just throughout the life, uh, life cycle of the boiler. Uh, the, so the back end of the boiler is completely encased in water. Uh, this helps inc increase the efficiency, um, there's more water volume, and it, it prevents the heat loss that you would, you would get with a dry back so as it goes in the refractory and then uh, leaves the boiler. Um, the refractory on a dry back receives all of the combustion heat and thermal stress directly to it. Uh, there's a baffling uh, and the door seals are prone to leakage uh, causing serious efficiency losses as the heat will just seep right out of the boiler. Um, and then actually getting in and repairing that rear door can be very expensive. Uh, it takes a lot of downtime for your boiler to get rid of all their refractory and put new uh, ones in. And then you sometimes have to replace that seal as well. So those are uh, sort of some concerns with the dry back. All right, this slide shows the inside of a boiler. Uh, the heating surfaces for fire tube boilers. Most boilers have a five square foot per boiler horsepower heating surface. Um, sort of as a minimum and then you'll see this from probably about 50 horsepower all the way up to 250 horsepower for most fire tubes. In this slide we're going to start getting into some of the manufacturing of the fire tube boilers. Uh, as in this slide you can see uh, they're rolling the shell plate for the outer uh, the outside of the boiler. Uh, once the shell is rolled, uh, they'll do submerged arc welding uh, to weld the seams together. Yeah, you can also notice that the, uh, they use plasma tables and they cut all the openings into the plate prior to rolling it so that they're already there for when they put the uh, openings into the pressure vessel. So here is assembly of a tube sheet. Uh, you'll notice that it has a corrugated Morrison tube, which is used for a higher pressure fire tube boilers. And the corrugation of the Morrison tube also allows for more surface area uh, in contact with the water, uh, so more uh, heat transfer to the water for better efficiency. Correct. Uh, here the boiler manufacturer uh, has an o enclosed uh, x-ray facility where they x-ray the welds uh, to check for integrity uh, before they move it on in production. This is a stress relieving oven where the boiler is uh, baked uh, for a time period in order to uh, uh, relieve all the stresses in the metal. Here we're looking at the drilling of the tube sheet. Some manufacturers laser cut uh, their tube sheets um, and then others do drilling uh, because it allows for a tighter tolerance uh, than the laser cutting. Uh, the grooves also that are left by the drill bit allow the tube to uh, the tube hole to hold the tube in place. Um, so that's just an added benefit. Um, then you can see in the top right there's a broach uh, tube blank uh, that's left over from. Here we have a picture of the tubes being uh, rolled and expanded. A is the, the most basic setup, that's a expanded roll and bead. Uh, B is a Proser expand roll and bead. 
which really locks the tube on both sides of the tube sheet. And finally, the third is the ProSur expand roll bead and seal weld for additional rigidity uh, with the tube connected to the tube sheet. So Grant, why would you ever weld the tubes on both sides? Well, one application would be glycol, because glycol is a very thin liquid and can find its way through the seams between the tube and the tube sheet, so welding it will keep it uh, from leaking. Got it. Here we have the different types of tubes. On your right, that's a standard tube, typically 0.105 in thickness. On the right hand, on the left hand side, you have rifled tubes or XID tubes that give you uh, a, a more surface area and create uh, more turbulence when the flue gases go through them. And that helps the efficiency. Yes. Uh, here we have a nice picture of uh, assembled boiler in the tube sheet. Um, as you can see, there's nice even spacing between the tubes, uh, which allows for uh, good water circulation in between the tubes uh, to receive a uh, even heat transfer uh, to the water. Um, it's very important for efficiency. All right, so after the boiler is completed its assembly, uh, it's sent uh, to the hydro test bay uh, where the boiler is pressurized well past its um, pressure rating and it's held for a certain period of time uh, to ensure that it holds uh, its pressure rating. If it doesn't, it's sent back um, to the assembly line to be fixed. And if you're good to go, it's sent off to the paint shop. Uh, here we have a very old picture of uh, two guys assembling the trim on the boiler. You can see they've already put the burner on uh, and they're now putting in the uh, water level and cutoffs and blowdowns. This is the uh, test bay where the final assembly of the trim and the control panels, VFDs and wiring takes place. After that they'll do a, a complete fire test. Uh, where they'll check for emissions and uh, fuel air ratio uh, settings. So you would definitely recommend having a, a boiler fire tested before it's sent off? Absolutely. It would uh, uh, prevent uh, having problems down the road, make sure all your wiring is correct, and that it's going to perform according to specifications. In this slide, we're going to talk about the general steam boiler trim. As you can see in the top left, you got your safety valves uh, for your steam. Uh, in case you went over the, uh, the steam pressure in the boiler, you would vent the steam. Uh, then you have your TDS control valve. That's total dissolved solids. Uh, that's your continuous blowdown of your boiler. Um, and that will measure the, uh, there's a sensor that will measure the conductivity of the water. Uh, and when it reaches a certain limit, that control valve will open and allow the uh, certain amount of the water to uh, escape from the top of the boiler. Um, and then uh, you have your slow opening blow-off valves uh, on the left-hand side there, and then your quick opening uh, blow-down valves as well. Um, and then you see your TDS uh, controller right there that controls the valves. Um, in the bottom left hand side you'll see the feed water control valve. Uh, this can be either electric or uh, pneumatic depending on the size of your system and your, uh, the controls there. Uh, this obviously controls uh, how quickly the feed water will enter the boiler uh, based on your, uh, your water level uh, in the boiler and your cutoffs and uh, what kind of feed water system you might have. Then on the right hand side you can see the uh, water level control uh, which is going to give you a modulating signal for your feed water valve if you have a modulating feed water otherwise it may be just a pump controller which would give you a dry contact to start a pump. Then you have your low water cutoff typically that would be a, a, a float type and then you would have an auxiliary low water cutoff that would be a probe type. And then up above on the top, you can see for a typical high pressure boiler, 
you'll have a uh, non-return valve and a gate valve and all of those uh, components there are ASME uh, pieces and have to be manufactured by the boiler manufacturer. And then on the upper right we also have the uh, operating limit, high limit, and modulating controls and of course your boiler pressure gauge. On this slide we're going to take a look at the hot water boiler uh, general trim uh, that you have on a high temperature hot water boiler. Uh, you got your operating temperature limit, your high temperature limit, and then your modulating temperature control which modulates the firing rate of your burner. Um, the operating temperature limit uh, determines whether the boiler is going to turn on or off. Um, you got your slow opening drain valve uh, on the left hand side there. Um, and then you got your feed water stop and check valves um, entering the boiler. Uh, on the top side we have our safety valves as required, uh, your water return coming back from your system, uh, and then your water supply going out uh, to your system, and then uh, you got your water level control uh, and water alarm um, right there as a float type that's depicted. On this slide, uh, we're going to start getting into the uh, burners, controls, uh, different uh, styles that you can go with dependent on um, really the size of your plant, uh, how you want it to operate, how efficient you want it to operate, sort of how sophisticated you want to get with it. On this slide, we talk about the three main types of burner control. Um, you got your old style, which is the jack shaft or single point positioning. You see this on a lot of older burners. Um, so basically there's one point of control and that is your fuel oil valve and there's an actuator on that. From there all other control valves, dampers, are controlled via jack shaft based off of that one actuator. So the problem with this is it's prone to slop, slippage, whatever you want to call it, but because of that linkage, there's always going to be a little hysteresis in there. Um, if your set screw ever slips, you're going to have to go in and completely retune it. Um, it requires lots of tuning. There's a little turn down to this burner. You don't have very tight control, and normally uh, you're not going to see this on any kind of burner or boiler that's really concerned about uh, their emissions, their efficiency. It's very straightforward. Um, not, not much to it type of uh, control system. The next step up in control would be a parallel positioning system. In this type of system, each point of control has its own servo motor or actuator. They could be either electric or pneumatic. Uh, typically very accurate uh, servos are used for precise controls. Uh, the the uh, CPU basically memorizes an f of x curve for each uh, control point. Um, you could get a 10 to 1 turndown on natural gas and an 8 to 1 turndown on oil depending on the burner manufacturer. This is an excellent choice for control of emissions for low NOx burners, sub 30 ppm and ultra low NOx burners. Uh, after parallel positioning, we move into fully metered control. This is the most uh, complex type of system. In this system, the points of contact have uh, fuel flow meters that would measure oil flow, gas flow, and air flow. Uh, the controller will set out a set point for oil, for example, of say, let's say 10 gallons a minute. It'll monitor the fuel uh, meter and uh, when it gets to that point it will uh, hold it steadily at that flow rate. So you have basically a uh, flow meter with feedback um, and uh, there's the ability to use temperature and pressure compensated uh, meters. Um, this is a very precise control and is normally used for uh, industrial applications and larger water tube boilers.
So here's a typical uh, submittal drawing that you would see uh, for a boiler burner package. As you can see, the boiler's mounted th uh, there with the burner. Uh, you got your gas um, train on the right side of the boiler. Uh, again, that can be right side, left side, doesn't matter. You can see the control panel's actually hanging off the left side of the boiler uh, as it was specified on that job. But that control panel can really be mounted anywhere. Uh, it can come on unistrut right next to the burner. Um, and then you can also see there's a pipe coming down off the exhaust of the boiler and that would be the FGR line, flue gas recirculation. Uh, flue gas recirculation is used to, to help lower the NOx emissions and it's also used uh, to help with the efficiency of the boiler as you're reusing some of that hot exhaust air to heat, preheat the combustion air that's coming into the burner as well. Um, so this is a very, it's a very easy thing to add to the job. Uh, we recommend it, um, but again, it's not required at all. Um, you can also see the trim on the boiler. They have the probe uh, style water level and then um, also a float as well. And then you have your uh, continuous blow off with your controller uh, there as well. This is a picture of the left side of the boiler. Uh, you can see there's the control panel. There's a power panel next to it. Uh, which will just basically take in the uh, high voltage power and then distribute it, uh, the 120 for the control panel and then the high voltage uh, to the uh, blower motor and if there's an air compressor, if it was oil, uh, basically any other motors. But it's good to bring it into a power panel as opposed to bringing all the high voltage uh, electrical uh, cable into the control panel. You can get uh, lots of electrical noise and that's uh, not good for anybody. Uh, so here's your a typical PNID of your air and flue gas um, throughout your boiler system. Uh, as you can see on the top there you got your flue gas recirculation control valve controlling the how much of the flue gas is going to come in. Um, it's important to have a control valve there. It can't just uh, allow all of the exhaust uh, to come back in. Um, you got your combustion air damper. Um, obviously it controls uh, how much air you're going to uh, bring into the burner. Um, then there's also a draft damper uh, on the outlet of the boiler. And you typically, uh, you definitely want to keep that draft negative, but very slightly negative. Uh, if it's too high of a draft, you're going to pull the flame right off the burner head and you're going to have definitely have stability issues uh, if it's uh, if you don't have enough draft you're going to tend to trip out the boiler on uh, high furnace pressure this is the main gas piping uh, PNID diagram starting from the left you have your basic uh, hand shutoff valve uh, you have a Y strainer pressure gauge uh, low gas pressure switches uh, safety shutoff valves uh, with a block and bleed arrangement generally um, and then as you go farther you have a high gas pressure switch and then your uh, control valve leading into the uh, into the burner. Alright in this slide we're going to start talking about our auxiliary uh, feed water systems and uh, the, some of the equipment that goes uh, on the boiler uh, to deal with uh, the water and the condensate coming back. Uh, so First off, we're going to talk about the blowdown heat recovery system. Uh, this just helps remove impurities uh, from the surface of the water of the boiler. Um, it preheats the boiler feed water and then uh, it also cools the blowdown water down to 140 degrees, uh, which is a requirement before you send it off down the drain. In the top right, we're going to talk about boiler feed systems and deaerators. Uh, you can either have a regular boiler feed tank or you could have a pressurized deaerator. Uh, those are two uh, different things and we'll talk about when and when not to use uh, one or the other. Uh, these help remove the oxygen and air from the uh, feed water which is the main cause of corrosion of your boiler tubes and your fire tubes and that it also helps preheat the feed water going into your boiler uh, which helps with your efficiency. In the bottom left, uh, we're going to talk about maybe some flash tanks and um, high pressure condensate returns uh, back to your system. 
uh, and then bottom right, uh, blow down steam systems. Again, it removes the impurities from the boiler and it uh, gets rid of the, um, it, it takes the, the hot water from the boiler, uh, it flashes some of it to steam, and then the rest of it, it cools it down to below 140 degrees again before it goes down the drain. Uh, the steam cycle. So we're going to look real quick, as you can see in this uh, little schematic. Uh, you got your boiler on the bottom left, fuel coming in, uh, obviously making steam, uh, and then it's going to that steam is going to go out to here, whether it's a process, whether you're heating some buildings, um, you know what have you. Steam goes out to the system, um, and then you know what's what's coming back. So as you, you can see on the bottom there. Uh, you're going to obviously lose uh, some condensate um, and then you're going to have your gravity returns uh, that come back and we're just going to look at a simple boiler feed water system or feed water tank, atmospheric tank. So you got your gravity returns coming back to your tank, you got your uh, low pressure uh, trap returns that come from your steam trap and you're going to drop those down to a, a condensate tank uh, and then you're going to basically pump that con what's in that condensate tank all the way back to the boiler feed water tank. From your feed water tank, you're going to pump it into your boiler. Um, and then you're going to control uh, the makeup water, your city water coming into your feed water tank uh, with a control valve. And uh, that's sort of how, and, and it's all going to be uh, watching the level of the boiler, and that's going to be sending out the signal um, how much feed water to bring in from that tank. Now these are usually just open closed valves. In the case of the boiler, it has a pump controller that just says to start the boiler feed pump until it fills. And then in the case of the makeup, you know, that could be just a solenoid valve with a level switch that would uh, turn that on and off. Right, so very simple design, you know, shown here. Correct. This slide is uh, showing a, a little more complex system typically used with a high pressure plant. The boiler uh, sends the steam out, out to the load, then you have uh, gravity returns, you have condensate returns from the condensate tanks, and they, they get all pumped back to a what we call a surge tank, um, and that surge tank is uh, the level there is maintained with a makeup city water valve. That water is then pumped into a deaerator. Uh, the deaerator, we bring in steam and we regulate the pressure at typically five pounds. By bringing the steam into the deaerator, it heats up the water and drives the air out of the water, which then goes up a vent and is uh, vented to atmosphere. Um, in this particular case, they show a feed water pump that's connected to the boiler, so when the boiler needs more water, it uh, closes a contact and starts the pump. Uh, in, in a different type of system, you can have a header with a modulating valve on the boiler, uh, and that would be another level of uh, sophistication. And we'll get into all that later, the different feed water um, system styles that you can go with. So Grant, when would you use a boiler feed water tank, just sort of an atmospheric tank, as opposed to a deaerator? Well, typically deaerators are used on high pressure plants, uh, but one of the factors that one should consider is, is how much makeup is being brought into the system. If you're only down around a 10% makeup, that means you don't really have a lot of oxygen getting into the system. But if you're at 80% makeup and all that raw city water is coming into your system constantly, then you're really going to want to look at a deaerator to get rid of that, that additional oxygen. Got it. Okay. All right. So on this slide, we're going to talk about why you use a deaerator. Um, and a couple of comments as why is one, it removes the non-condensable gases from the boiler feed water, i.e. oxygen and others. Uh, it heats the feed water, uh, which helps with your efficiency, and um, the 
really helps with the thermal uh, stresses of the boiler. You're not going from super cold water and then heating it up very quickly inside the boiler. Um, provides a place to use energy recovered in the system, uh, reduces the blowdown um, that you're sending out, and reduces the chemical usage that you'd have to use to treat the water. Um, and then it also increases the heat exchanger efficiency, i.e. your boiler. Another interesting point about heating that feed water is cold feed water going into a boiler can cause a boiler to condense when it normally wouldn't condense. And condensation in a boiler is basically an accumulation of acids that could corrode the boiler. So by preheating the feed water, you eliminate that possibility. All right, on this slide, we're just going to point out the three main types of deaerators. We got your typical spray type. We have your tray type, and then we have your steam flow unit, which is actually a combination of a condensate tank and a deaerator all in one. Here we have a jet spray type deaerator. Uh, these are pretty inexpensive deaerators. Um, again, this is a pressurized one, so um, you got no gravity returns, uh, no trapped returns. Uh, this is easy to package and uh, locate inside a boiler room. Uh, it usually comes on a stand with uh, pump, the pumps underneath. Uh, it's very easy to um, break off that tank from the stands and rig, uh, rig the tank into place and then bring in the stand and pumps. Uh, later on and you can reassemble it down the boiler room or you can always have the tank cut up and uh, re-welded in the field. Um, so this is used uh, when there's uh, more than 70 percent makeup uh, and then less than 30 percent uh, in returns. This is built for steady state operation as opposed to batch process uh, for instance like a school where it's you know on in the morning off at night uh, this is more for like a heating operation or for um, you know a process plant something like that um, but uh, this, it's definitely uh, built for um, not huge load swings and on and off on and off basically uh, with your boiler system here we have a tray type deaerator uh, so you have the makeup water that comes in from the top uh, it filters down through these through a set of trays and then you have your steam coming in from the left side that comes up and as the water falls through the different trays uh, your steam interacts with the water uh, and as you can see the oxygen would go up move up around the water and go out the vent um, and then you have your deaerated feed water that basically just falls down to the bottom of the tank and uh, then it's from there it's pumped into the boilers uh, and then you also have your trapped returns uh, that come back, which most of the trapped returns obviously have the water has already been deaerated, uh, so that can just drop down uh, into the bottom of the tank and pumped to the boilers. Um, so it has a high uh, initial cost, much more than the uh, spray type. Uh, and you can see the tank sort of made up of two parts. You got your vertical on top where your tray is, and then your horizontal which would just hold the boiler feed water before it's pumped. Um, it's used to high temperature returns. It has great turn down and again deaerates to uh, 0 0.005 cubic centimeters per liter of oxygen. Um, it's good for different load swings. Um, uh, it's also been around for a very long time. Uh, so this is a, a tried and true unit. So here we have the steam flow unit. Uh, this is a pressurized recycling unit. It can handle zero to 100% makeup. Um, it can take the high temperature returns, has 100% turn down, uh, 0.05 uh, cubic centimeters per liter of oxygen. Uh, this thing acts as a condensate return and a deaerator all in one, as you'll see in the next slide. Right, and the process of this uh, tank is one where there's a continuous pump running. So it's constantly deaerating and it's not uh, dependent upon the flow of steam or the flow of water. Right, that, there's a circulator pump that you can see in sort of the back left of that picture uh, underneath the tank. 
uh, that's the pump that is continuously recirculating. Right, so that allows it to have 100% turn down. This is a diagram of a steam flow compartmentalized deaerator and surge tank combined into one. On the left side, you have undeaerated feed water, and on the right, you have deaerated feed water. Uh, it works with a uh, recycling pump that constantly pumps the uh, undeaerated water uh, through a manifold, um, which mixes in with the steam. Uh, on the left hand side, the makeup comes into the tank, and uh, uh, the uh, pumped returns come in the top and, and trapped returns also come in the top. And uh, the deaerated water goes out uh, the bottom on the lower right. So the advantages of the steam flow system, it will provide uh, 0 0.005 cc per liter performance under all variable loads. Guaranteed performance is from, 100, from 0 to 100% load. Start boiler with heated deaerated feed water will provide guaranteed performance with pump returns any percent. No surge tank required because it's built into the unit. Costs less to install than two individual tank systems and it will accept trap returns that have limited uh, steam pressure or pressure behind them. Now we're going to start talking about uh, continuous blowdown heat recovery systems. Uh, for coming off of the blowdown of the boiler. In this diagram, we're just looking at a general overview of the system. Bottom right, you got your blowdown separator coming off the bottom of the boiler. Top left, continuous blowdown heat recovery system that we're going to get into. You got your deaerator. And uh, we're going to get into each of the, we've already spoken about the deaerator. We're going to get into uh, more of the details on the heat recovery systems and the separator. Sure. This is a, uh, a blowdown separator. Basically what it's taking is the bottom blowdown from the boiler, which has to be done periodically to get the sediment off the bottom of the boiler. So the operator will open up the valves and uh, run the boiler water through here. Uh, the, any steam will go up through the uh, exhaust head and the, the rest of it will go down uh, and it will be tempered with the uh, cold water from the after cooler so that the water going into the sewer doesn't exceed 140 degrees. Here we have a blowdown tank. Uh, this is different from a separator in that essentially it acts the same except the temperature of the water coming in from the boiler is dispersed via convection and just basically the time that it, it sits in the tank it will disperse disperse its heat through the vent and then when it reaches a certain height it's going to overflow uh, down into the drain um, at less than 140 degrees um, if need be there are uh, cooling water inlets that you could also bring in uh, if needed so just in summary, the main difference between a blowdown tank and a blowdown separator that we talked about previously is that the blowdown tank really holds the water and allows it to cool to 140 or less, whereas the blowdown separator, the, uh, it's a much quicker process where the steam is flashed and vented and then the, the water is controlled uh, that's leaving the tank via a temperature control valve. Yeah, this slide is a continuous blowdown heat recovery unit which basically combines the blowdown tank with a uh, heat exchanger. Uh, so the blowdown comes into the tank, it uh, uh, resides there for a while, then as it flows out it goes through a heat exchanger which preheats the makeup water going from the deaerator into the boiler. Uh, also, you'll notice on this slide that the, this unit has a level controller um, and what that does is it allows the tank to fill up with water 
and once it it reaches a certain level set point it opens the control valve to allow the the water to drain at 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Feed water system design. So here in this first slide uh, we're going to look at a system that has dedicated pumps one per boiler and they're on off pumps so you have three boilers three pumps one dedicated pump per each again control is on off of the pumps and then these are uh, the level of the boilers and the control of the pumps is just based off of uh, McDonald and Miller switches uh, that are just dry contacts. Uh, there's no motorized ball, uh, ball valves in between the boilers uh, for control. Uh, it's just on off based on the level in the boiler. Uh, the problem with this one is one pump goes dead, your boiler's dead. So that's why we definitely recommend a headered system so you can have some backup and redundancy with those pumps. Or you could uh, add a extra pump that could then be piped in as a backup to the the pump that failed right which is a uh, 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 not uncommon another thing that you could do and you were talking about motorized valves is sometimes you'll have a problem with a boiler where it will um, the, the the boiler will fill up with water mm -hmm. um, when it's not running so what we've done is put a motorized valve sort of in series with the pump mm -hmm. so when the boiler calls for water we open the motorized valve it op hits an end switch and that starts the pump mm -hmm. and then the it will fill the boiler and then when the boiler is filled the contact opens up and then the the, the uh, motorized valve closes and the pump stops and that way you have a positive shutoff valve between the DA or the boiler feed tank and the boiler. These next two slides we're going to talk about the boiler feed water uh, switches for the water level. Uh, we've been mentioning them throughout but on this first slide uh, we have a typical McDonald Miller float type style that you see on lots of boilers, uh, lots of fire tube boilers. Um, typical applications are primary and secondary pump controller, uh, the low water uh, fuel cutoff for steam boilers, um, motorized valve control, low water cutoff, high water cutoff, alarm actuator. Uh, again, these are all just based off of dry contact switches um, when the float reaches a certain level. Uh, and you can see down below there are a couple different levels that you can take a look at. And typically these low water cutoffs are either float type or probe type. Uh, back in the day of mercury switches, the float type were considered very, very reliable and long-lasting. Now that they've switched them all to snap action, they're not as reliable. So more, more and more probe type uh, cutoffs are being used. Um, and this is uh, a, a, an example of a probe type, which is <clears throat> basically two electrical probes, and they measure the uh, the electrical. Uh, field between the two and they can tell whether there's water there or not. And these have no moving parts so they're very uh, unlikely to fail. Now Grant, is it a bad idea to have both a float type and a probe type or is that No, that's, that's perf per perfectly fine. You always want to have an auxiliary low water cutoff so you can't just have one, you have to have two. So typically people have one float type and then they'll have a, a probe type. Getting back to the feed water system design, uh, here we have a header system on off is what we call it. Uh, we get, so the pumps are on off, they're not controlled by VFDs um, and the pumps are all piped into a feed water header so that way all the pumps are redundant to each other um, so that uh, helps ensure smooth operation in case one goes bad. Uh, but in between the pump and the, bo the header and the boiler, there's also a motorized ball valve uh, with limit switches uh, for uh, feedback of open or closed uh, back to the controller. So the feed water valve will modulate 
uh, based off of the float uh, or probe that's on the uh, boiler itself. And then as you can see, there's also a piped uh, bypass around it in case you ever needed to work on that control valve or if that control valve um, died and you, you, could on, you could still run it with uh, just the ball valve in the case of an emergency. Uh, this is a uh, headered feed water system, a little more complicated than the, the, uh, the previous one that we're looking at. In this case, we have a uh, boiler feed water tank or deaerator um, with three uh, headered feed water pumps and a feed water meter. Um, in this case, the, uh, the, the boiler um, will modulate its own feed water valve to fill the, the boiler. Um, whereas the header has a pressure transmitter and maintains a constant pressure um, with a recirc line to give a minimum feedback uh, of the feed water back to the feed tank. This uh, keeps the, the uh, feed water pumps from being deadheaded and uh, not um, and overheating from, from not having any flow. Over on the right, left-hand side, you also show the city water makeup line, which is controlled by the feed water panel, and uh, a level transmitter on the feed water tank. Thank you again for joining us today. That's a wrap for our webinar. Uh, we really appreciate you guys tuning in. Again, my name's Robert Bond. This is Grant Bowman. And. Uh, we uh, would be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Uh, our emails are below, and please uh, check out our All website right, to see how we can um, best serve Robert you guys. Bond. Uh, have a great day. Grant Bowman is on the line. Grant, if you're there, uh, feel free to just unmute your microphone. Yep, I'm here. All right, thanks for joining us, Grant. All right, we just have a couple questions that we're gonna start out with. Let me share my screen. Everyone to see. All right, Grant, um, let's just start with this question. And, and Robert, if you, uh, Robert's here with me. So, Robert, if you want to answer, just let me know. Um, first question is Are you going to talk about top and bottom blowdowns? Uh, we would like to learn more about the differences and why and when. Uh, so, I, I believe uh, the, um, we're going to talk. So, the top blowdown, uh, we, I, I like to think of it, and a lot of people uh, call it by the, a blow-off system that kind of help you blowing off the top of the water. Um, basically, that's where a lot of the impurities and junk that gets into the water will kind of foam to the top. Um, and so you'll blow that down um, and based um, on the conductivity of the water. Uh, you can do that uh, with sort of a manual set needle valve uh, to continually do that, or you can also um, do it with a, a conductivity probe, and that will automatically open, you know, a solenoid valve, blow it off, and then close it uh, when the when the set points met. Uh, blow down, uh, obviously, you're blowing down the bottom of the boiler. Uh, there's an opening at the bottom, and that's good practice for any um, boiler maintenance. Um, person or engineer that's on site and that's obviously all the junk in the water that will settle to the bottom you want to blow that down and get that out of the boiler Grant, I don't know if you have anything else to add on that well the surface blow down really is to get rid of the dissolved solids that's in the water because they have a tendency to collect at the at the surface and then the uh, the bottom blow down is just the sediment and the, the, the crud that just collects at the bottom of the boiler so that's a, the bottom. The bottom blowdown is something that's done like you know maybe uh, once a day, and it's a manual operation. Uh, the surface blowdown is usually done with an automatic controller that right. measures the conductivity. Great. One thing before we go to any more questions, I just want to remind everyone: if you would like a copy of our Boilers Demystified, you can go ahead and email me, which is my my email on the screen right now and we'll be able to send you out, out this 11 by 17 laminated piece of uh, boiler information where you can put on your desk and use as reference to help you when you're designing the boiler systems. 
The other thing is, is the other webinars we have going on, uh, which are um, cold, wa uh, cold weather, fuel design, and then also renewable fuel webinar we'll have in two weeks. Um, so just getting those few things out of the way, we have one another question. Does the level site glass need to have visible level when the auxiliary low water cutoff activates? Grant, you want to go ahead with that one? Um, I'm a, a little puzzled. Can you repeat that question? Sure. Does the level sight glass need to have visible level have visible level when the auxiliary low water cutoff activates? Maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, you'll see you'll see the the level in the. I mean, if it's below that, I mean, yeah, you would get your cutoff, right? I mean, because that's the level in the boiler. If it goes below that, you're you're gonna get your cutoff and shut the boiler down. Um, yeah, I, I, there's there's ASME rules on exactly where the sight glass, I believe, has to show. But typically, if you're down to the auxiliary low water, which is the, you know, the the lowest one. Um, that could possibly be below the site glass. In other words, it may show an empty site glass. Right. Okay. 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 Uh, next question. What's the difference between the continuous blowdown and the surface blowdown? It's the same thing. Yep. Yep. And no, yeah, normally based on conductivity, you can have a um, a controller that will. Um, automatically do that for you blow to blow off the the surface so you're continuously blowing off the surface it, it's yeah okay um that's all the questions we have right now um if anyone else has any other questions we will sit around for a little bit grant or rob do you guys want to go over what acs does and how they can help uh some of the people in this webinar if you're around uh the new york city area well, but before you do that, I, I did see a request come in that wanted to have that uh, boiler sheet in a PDF format. Um, is sure. that something we have available? Right, we can. I can send it out in a PDF uh, form, absolutely. Uh, we, we have both PDF and 11 by 17, and some people would just rather have it in a PDF. Um, a lot of people find it handy to have it actually on their desk, but we can send it out either way, yes. Also, this recording will be on YouTube, so if you want to go back and listen to any of the uh, sections, feel free to uh, check our YouTube channel or our website, and we'll we'll be posting this later. Um. So, yeah, uh, analytical and combustion systems. Uh, we're a New York City-based uh, rep. For, well, we're based in Connecticut, but right on the border of New York. Um, we're a representative firm uh, for a bunch of different OEMs. Uh, basically, we could take care of anything inside your boiler room. We uh, do di gas detection systems, which are becoming uh, even more popular, especially um, uh, in the New York City area and then branching out from there. We do feed water systems for boilers, uh, fire tube boilers, water tube boilers, condensing boilers, um, uh, unit steam generators. Um, we do, um, uh, we actually have a small firebox uh, boiler that we also uh, like to promote because it can, uh, from I think 30 horsepower to 120 horsepower, it can fit right through a doorway. So you can get it, um, you know, factory packaged, piped, wired, uh, ready to go. Um, uh, we also do uh, fuel oil systems for diesel uh, emergency backup generators, uh, you know, obviously also for boiler loops. Um, we have those uh, fuel oil systems. Um, let's see, what else do we do? Oh, we do. We have um, underground a double wall uh, prefabbed um, piping for steam, hot water, uh, cold water, uh, fuel oil systems. Um, we have flexible um, double wall contained piping, uh, which is becoming very popular in uh, New York City or you know anytime you have a high rise. Um, it's uh, very nice. It comes in a nice roll um, and then you, easy for the contractors to install. So lots of uh, labor costs saved um, in doing that. Um, got anything else, Grant? Oh, economizers. We do pretty much anything to do with a boiler, burner, uh, controls, um, 
you know, your plant master for your boiler room. We also have all of that stuff. Um, we have different OEMs that we can sort of um, mix and match to meet your specific needs. Um, we also do a lot of help with, uh, if, if you ever needed help uh, designing that kind of a system, we do that as well. You're like a single source responsibility for we, yes, we, we like to be. And, and we can also, you know, so we can help with the design. We can price it up for you guys. We, um, you know, if it came, to, if, if we ever were able to get the job, we do all of our own commissioning. Uh, we own the project. Um, and then we got, you know, help. If you ever needed direct, so anything direct source to the OEMs, that's not a problem at all. Uh, Grant, you've been doing this a lot longer than I have. You got anything else to add? <laughs> uh, I think you've covered it pretty well. I mean, we'll do, uh, you know, large, high-pressure industrial plants, like in a hospital or a district heating system, and then mm -hmm. we'll do uh, smaller uh, school plants type, type of boiler rooms uh, and commercial small light industrial boiler rooms. Mm -hmm. Everything basically up from residential. Well, it is uh, three o'clock. I see some people did uh, comment and they want a PDF of the boiler demystified. All right, we'll send that out to you. Uh, give me today, tomorrow to be able to send that out. Just give me a little bit of time and I'll be able to email everyone that um, and everyone will be able to have it. If there's nothing else from uh, Rob or Grant, I think we will conclude the webinar. And um, yeah, we really appreciate everyone showing up and coming and listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Grant and Rob, and they'd uh, love to answer your um, your burner, boiler, and fuel oil questions. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.